Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Deciphering My Experience. I am with one of my favorite guests, John W. Warner the Fourth, and um, by favorite, it's because we've been talking for close to two hours uh, before we've even hit the record button because we were just having a blast conversing and uh, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's of the mysteries of life. But John, welcome very much back to the show. Thank you for having me. Whew! I'm glad we finally decided to hit record. <laughs> Yeah. We just, <laughs> we're going everywhere. Right now. <laughs> uh -huh. um, first and foremost, I want to let everybody know that John has graced us with um, this peach of a book right here. Oh, I'm not even showing John right now. I'm getting so ahead of myself. I'm just, uh, I'm just showing me. Let me get, uh, let me get John in the show. So we have, uh, let's see here. We'll put that there, and then we'll bring. John up. Boy, yeah, we're just way off the mark today. There's John. There's there me. Go. And we're recording a show finally. But this here is John's new book, Lion, Tiger, Bear. And I cannot speak more highly of this book. I am not a reader of fiction, typically, as a standard. I haven't been reading like I used to voraciously uh, prior to my trip to South Pole. I feel like they, they wiped out my desire to read. So I haven't been a big reader. But this book, I could not put this book down. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie, um, The Never-Ending Story. The character Bastion uh, becomes enamored by a book. And he just seems to be sneaking off into every nook and crevice in his life to burn through pages. And that's what I felt like when I got this book. It just seemed like every time I could, I was like, oh, hold on. There's a pause. I need, I need to get through the next few pages. Where are they at? What's happening? So you had me uh, from chapter one on this one, John. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I really tried to illustrate um, what happened that, that famous day in, in the Oval Office, which the meeting did take place. Mm -hmm. And I think they, those guys were all high-level Freemasons, and they definitely talked about the Foo Fighters and what was going on and all the crashes of UFOs going on during the war, because they were happening in the Pacific, too. I mean, uh, Halsey and uh, admirals, the other admirals, they were like, shit. Are these Japanese weapons? And the British are like, are they German? You know, the Germans thought they were ours. So, and um, being high level Freemasons, I, I think they had a good understanding of the occult and also, you know, a lot of the esoteric stuff going on in the world. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think that was one of the things that your book gave me keen insight on that I hadn't really considered before is, you know, as an American, you know, I, I was kind of singular in looking, you know, in the direction of the American government for disclosure. But then the reality is that globally, this is a, a global thing that's been going on forever. So it's not like just the American government was involved with covering it up in the conspiracy. There's all kinds oh, yeah. of factions that have been working um, behind closed doors, you know against each other and with each other, depending on the time of day and location, it would seem. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, what goes on in the book, I, I, the wars are proxy wars. Yes. Uh, E.T. is involved on both sides of mm -hmm. the equation, light and dark. And certainly... I think they always have been, at least for the last 12,000 years, I think. Even as we can see the, the, the characters yeah. in your book... Um, represent different factions and you can see in the you know going from chapter to chapter that affiliations change because that's reality yeah that's reality and of course they have to cooperate with the germans uh, mm -hmm. you know when they're on board this german airship mm -hmm. and uh, they're going through some wild adventures mm -hmm. but you know the the belief levels you know uh, bernie is a, a navy captain o and i and he's sort of like you and me all the way at the end of the rail line and B and Alice and Guafa, you know, they're they're playing catch up, but mm -hmm. they know that weird stuff is going on, and uh, and so Luz is back, you know, but he's part of B's dream world. I and really enjoyed like, Guafa as a character yeah. because he had this understanding and this presence, um, a calmness Maybe. almost, so to say, because he was a person who I think of probably maybe of all of the characters in the book, his paradigm was being twisted the most, I believe. Yeah. From where he came from, from to what he was being presented day to day, 
from what he knew. He was the one that was having to have his paradigm change the most, the fastest, I think. Right. Well, B, Alice, and Bernie are all from privileged, wealthy backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so they're gentlemen and ladies. But Guafa is, is a guy from, you know, a poor guy from uh, Mali mm -hmm. and uh, grew up in Timbuktu. His mother was Dogon, which the Dogon tribe are very, they say they're my, very much attached to the Namo people of Sirius. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that. Um, so, but he, he educated himself mm -hmm. in the Arabic tradition, you know, in libraries because he was smart. You don't have to be rich to be smart, you know, obviously. And, and so he did it on his own. And through synchronicity, they come together, as in life, people do, you mm -hmm. and I, you know, like minds, birds of a feather. Yep. So and he's very interesting to write about because the other ones, you know, they're, they're obnoxious and they, they joke around and everything. And he's taking all this stuff very seriously. And he's like, oh, shit, we're not only up against the Germans, but we're up against some very strange people. And it seemed to me that they were more um, resistant to things. They were more rigid, I guess, in their training, whereas his mind was more open to, well, this is what I'm seeing right now, so I'm not going to not going to um, argue with things that I was taught to say what I'm seeing isn't happening. You know, he was. It seemed like he was very quick to understanding and accepting things as they changed, compared to other people that I guess were more apprehensive and resistant to the moment. He seemed to embrace reality better than the others. He does because he's not programmed in schools and universities, and mm -hmm. he was, you know, he was he was a good soldier, but he was also disrespected authority and uh, you know thought for himself and read mm -hmm. books. You know, the, the story that uh, his fellow soldiers had to hide books for him mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the officers took them away. Mm -hmm. And that's based on real stories of the French Foreign Legion. You know, they didn't like the common soldier, the enlisted man, you know, reading philosophy and and uh, trans-Arabian wisdom and things like that. And mm -hmm. the occult, and Sufism, you know, they don't want that. Oh, my. Oh, this guy's a mystic. He's thinking for himself. So in that vein, he he's has a different experience, but they're all occultists. Mm -hmm. And of course, MI6 in London, they had an occult division and Ian Fleming was part of it. Hmm. And there's not much written about it, obviously, but I know they had one. And Churchill was privy to all that occult information. And Alistair Crowley was an MI6 agent. And he and Churchill definitely had meetings. Um, you know, so I'm wondering, very, it seems to me one of the, one of the, one of the things that, you know, I wouldn't say is covered per se, but a topic that gets touched on um, in your book is time, of course. You know, that is it linear, nonlinear, you know, what's real, what's unreal, you know, similar with, you know, the, the characters in the book. Some of them are characters, some of them are actually historical personages. And one of the people that jumped out on me that was um, discussed in the book was a gentleman by the name of Lloyd Berkner. And that was uh, very intriguing to me because I, I know that this is a real person that was oh, yeah. actually involved in some of these programs. So I'm, I'm curious um, because his name was only mentioned in there once to my recollection, but on a list of folks that uh, you placed with, if I'm remembering correctly, expeditions that went down to Antarctica prior to the war um, in cahoots with what would have been either the Germans or the Nazis or the SS by some title is, is, am I remembering the story correctly at least? Yeah. I mean, I take some liberties, but uh -huh. yes, there, there are stories that, I mean, the Germans definitely went to Antarctica starting in 1915, mm -hmm. which is during World War One. Okay. You know, whale oil, seal oil, mm -hmm. oh, come on, that's part of it, but that's not all of it mm -hmm. that's a lot of men and ships and material mm -hmm. going down there and they went down in the 20s and 30s mm -hmm. everyone knows the 38 39 expedition but i've read accounts where bird was down there as an advisor okay that's now so we weren't at war with the germans in the 20s and 30s okay and we didn't know we were gonna go to war but so. then he certainly would have been learning what they were learning right okay bird definitely <laughs> knew some you know esoteric information and of the world do you know believe. if berkner was with bird at that point with them i don't know okay. i can't remember if i'd have to look at my notes because my understanding on my notes was that berkner was beside bird for 
all of the Antarctic stuff. So if you're going to put Bird with the Germans there, then my research he, says Berkner yeah. was with him. He probably was. Because it was my understanding that Berkner was with Bird um, doing stuff prior to the known Antarctic expeditions. And I didn't get much info on that one, but that it was because of those activities that got him with the ones that we know were funded. Yeah. And then post um, all, all Antarctic operations, Berkner wound up getting um, a very interesting um, office at Brookhaven National Labs on Long Island. Right. I, I think what's going on in the 20th century is that Antarctica uh, was well known for being a place where there was ancient ruins and possibly some ancient technology to be found. Mm -hmm. uh, who was down there living down there? Was it an, an Atlantis colony? I think maybe it was. It might have been international, like a lot of things that were pre-Diluvian. But there's no doubt, given all the military bases today, I think Turkey wants one, China has five, mm -hmm. America probably has 50. I have no idea. The Russians have some, you know, I think it stands to reason that it's an extremely interesting place for a lot of things going on. Oh yeah. And the history, you know, supports that. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote it that way. And I, you know, I talk about breakaway Germans living down there. I think that's possible. I think there's a good probability that happened. I know Penny talks about it and everything. And I so, think it's very, very highly likely. Operation high jump. I mean, everyone knows that, but it, that's, something happened down there and it was big and it was before the war and it was after the world war ii so it's logical to assume that you know all the stories probably have validity to them mm -hmm. yeah i i feel like it's just too much resource available and that the conversation is great for everybody to talk about you know i i trust me i get the logistics of doing stuff in antarctica i assure people of that but even with that being said, I do understand profiteering and a monopoly market. And that when you have an environment like Antarctica that no one's paying attention to, it means there's a lot less hands in the till simply. So profits can go up. I mean, that's a simple equation. So you might have really hard logistics lines, but if nobody knows what's really going on there and there's, you know, 80% less hands in the till, then your, your bottom line is greatly impacted. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I worked at a gold mine out here in Alaska at one point that was, you know, how do I put it? <laughs> a scam? <laughs> because we were pulling gold out of the ground. I mean, it's a gold mine. It's a gold mine that was going bankrupt. It was a gold mine going bankrupt as we're pulling gold out of the ground. I guess there was some issue with the company not running. I don't know. How do you run a gold mine into the ground? So just like, know. you know, it's like. But this brings up a point that we were talking about before you were recording. Mm -hmm. and that is, um, there's a young man who has a, a small channel on YouTube. It's called Mind Earth. Mm -hmm. And I believe his hypothesis that all these places in Peru and maybe Chaco Canyon, sure, later on, different cultures use them as sacred sites. But before that, they kind of look industrial. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And they might have been about gold and mineral mining, rare earth minerals and other things. Yeah, and, and uh, feeding massive amounts of labor. Right. That's usually and what the facilities labor. seem to be set up for. And yeah, and some sort of um and some sort of arena area to keep massive amounts of people entertained. Yeah. Uh I don't know about that. I, I tend to think that, you know, given the Anunnaki stories mm -hmm. and other stories about, you know, I think the earth has been mined for hundreds of millions of years, mm -hmm. if not billions. Oh yeah. And I think a lot of these, you know, I like the idea of, of these ancient megalithic sites as being spiritual and mystical, but come on. Um, they look, Saxe, Huaman and mm -hmm. Chaco Canyon and other places, uh, the hillside, the giant hillside terraces in Peru, I've seen them. It only makes partial sense for food production. I think they deify things and call them temples when they're just yeah. simply, you know, um, practical energy devices. Right. You know, that, you know, they call it spirit. They call it this. It's just, it's just, there's an energy thing going on. There's something that you can practic practically tap into 
or or yeah. gain the benefit thereof. You know, whether it's you know putting the crops in there for the food to be you know have more yeah, multi multi purpose. Yeah, all of the above. Yes. And I like Brian Forster. He does a great job, but mm -hmm. he would have none of this theory when I emailed him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think people are, are very upset that a lot of these sacred sites might have been about you know slavery, industrial mining, mm -hmm. uh, processing, uh, and, you know, an industrial mm -hmm. site. Just because it looks beautiful to us and has all these melted polygonal stones, mm -hmm. I mean, there's zigzag arrays of them at Sacsayhuaman. And nearby, there's all these other sites mm -hmm. that look kind, you know, and these circular pits that look like today's mining pits. I mean, come on. I've kind of only really started paying attention to um, Star Forts and Star Cities since I've been paying attention to your stuff. I mean, I've, I've seen them before. I've known them as bastion forts, but I never paid that much attention to them. But as a tradesman, and now that they're on my radar... Yes, there is a lot of questions that need to be asked because there is no way, there's no way these structures are to be taken at, as represented. There's way more well, labor involved and there's, yeah, there's, me, there's way let off. Me, let me expand. I can honestly say I'm, as a military historian, I've read every book in English I can about star forts mm -hmm. because on my history forum, I really tried to drill down on this. Mm -hmm. This is what I've come up with. Um, and I think it's close to the truth. A lot of people, they came out, oh, these can't be for military. They don't make any sense. They must be for some peaceful earth, you know, worldwide civilization. Mm -hmm. It's about energy production and blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm sorry. No. Um, when you read about military history and how cannons work, how in-depth defenses work, troop movements, uh, borders and how, how it all worked out and how you needed to fortify cities, it makes sense. We lived in, we've lived we lived in a warlike world for the last 12,000 years, at least. Mm -hmm. Now, Atlantis was at war, too. Mm -hmm. These star forts came about right around 1350 and lasted up until 1850. Mm -hmm. They do make military sense for the most part. But I agree, there are some anomalies. Some of them seem so overbuilt that it defies logic. Yes. Now, they're, the people who designed and built these people were the architects and engineers. These were the cathedral builders. They I almost free. feel like when you say they make sense from a defensive standpoint, like in a way, because I feel like in the context of like if you were there at the time, it's like, well, there happens to be a star fort there because <laughs> we didn't build it. <laughs> But there happens to be a star fort there, and there's people coming to attack us. So we can either stay here in the, in the huts that we made, or we can go in that star fort and try to defend ourselves from there. Which, like yes. you said, they're so overfortified that in reality, in the grand scheme of the um, the oncoming enemy to a star fort, the star fort so outweighs it that people would just go around. There's no point in attacking the star fort. Right, and some of that is was the design idea. Mm -hmm. Remember, these Freemason architects and engineers. They were using sacred geometry patterns mm -hmm. and they were basically throwing mud against the wall and seeing what stuck because every star fort is different. And the conspiracy is there's no design plans and I can find no architectural plans on the internet, on mm -hmm. any archive. But remember, these were military installations. Wouldn't you design it and then burn the plans so your enemy couldn't, you know, there was a lot of spying going on. That does make sense. I, so in a, in a I sense it does, but in a practical application, those things used to get reoccupied and reoccupied six ways from Sunday. Yeah. So it was also one, and then you recapture it. You yeah, know. you know. So even the the prints, in a way, I would almost see prints getting remade and remade and remade. They're called as builds. Every guy that showed up would have a new set of prints made, so that they could then tactically go over what they plan on doing. We need to go send guys down to this tunnel, send guys down to that tunnel. I think there would be paperwork all over these things, actually. That makes more practical sense, that every time someone kicked the doors in, they'd want to know everything about it. Right. There are sketches mm -hmm. from the day, period correct sketches, mm -hmm. but never any elevations with measurements. Fair enough. I can find. You can find That's 
as a tradesman, it intrigues me because, you know, the grand scheme of rebuilding this, right? Someone, somewhere, some architect has the skill set to say, like, oh, if I was to build a star fort and these are the tools that were available and these are the materials that were available and this is manpower, it should just be a simple calculation. Somebody should be able to draw up a proposal that lays out everything to build a star fort contemporarily with all of the resources and materials of old, and we should be able to see a number on this. And that's why I think people don't show us the numbers on this, because it would show that it's baloney to consider that that's how it went down. The amount of labor involved, I think, would show that as presented for the materials and labor force available, that one of these star forts would have taken decades to actually construct. Yeah, well, they did. Well, many yeah, decades. Part. And then when you look at how many are strewn across the world, right. there's not that. That means that the whole world must have been comprised of skilled masons at the time and well, all been on the task yeah. of this. But let me, let me, let me, let me finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you can find measurements on some of the siege trenches. They're zigzag. Mm -hmm. Now, those aren't elevations. Those are sketches for siege trenches for mortars. Because Star Forts took mortar fire, um, which is an interesting concept. I mean, when when would you say mortaring started? Mortar fire. Understood. When when did mortaring start in war? Early. Okay. Around the same time, 1350, okay. 14. Small, but they mm -hmm. grew in size over the decades. Mm -hmm. Now, they did have a lot of skilled labor. Mm -hmm. However, if you look on old maps. Every damn city, almost every almost every town and city in Europe and elsewhere, it was fortified mm -hmm. with masonry, high high walls. Mm -hmm. Now there's an Italian town. You can look it up. It's called Palmanova, and it's it looks octagon, but it's a nanagon. It's nine sided. Mm -hmm. Now the bastion points on that thing are 50 feet high. Mm -hmm. That's enough to stop modern tanks and troops today, let alone you know 16th century cavalry and infantry. Mm -hmm. So it boggles the mind. It's like it's like parking a two billion dollar aircraft carrier off of a small Bar Harbor, Maine. A nice thing to do, mm -hmm. but come on, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> kind of ridiculous because Palmanova maybe housed I don't know five thousand people, maybe. It was a huge construction just for this one town. Mm -hmm. So it's very intriguing. Like I said, there are anomalies. But remember, we live in a warfare world mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. And everyone's like, well, there's star forts in Japan and, and uh, stuff. It's like, yeah, there was a lot of Western technology, like firearms that came with the I Jesuits. Just, I just look at the I mean, labor. It's not that big of a conspiracy. Jesuits made firearms? Oh yeah, in the 1500s. I didn't Portuguese know that. That makes sense. Technology. That makes sense. Yeah, they were matchlock rifles okay. and pistols. Very mm -hmm. crude, but they had it in the 1550s, mm -hmm. the Japanese. And so why wouldn't they build star forts? So there's not as much conspiracy as people think, but there are strange anomalies. And some of those things are so big and complex, like the ones in, in uh, Holland. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's just, I, the effort to me really life. blows my mind is the effort is almost uncalculable when you look at the size of these things and the, the earthworks involved. I mean, they're refacing huge tracts of land to do this. That's huge. You know, these right. people did not have Caterpillar D8s and D9s. This wasn't no. the world they lived in. But remember, in the 1600s, let's just say a time period, the 1600s in Europe, Mm -hmm. What did it? What did the royals and spend money on? Well, cathedrals, mm -hmm. churches, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly palaces and castles. Mm -hmm. But behind that is military. Mm -hmm. Just like today, military was you're not going to have a kingdom if somebody overruns you. So they're going to spend money on forts. Mm -hmm. And the fort chain in France and Holland is extensive. It does make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the hydraulics and everything makes sense for moats to slow down enemy troops. It definitely does. Mm -hmm. But in Holland, the hydraulics for the star forts are amazingly complex. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it's kind of like, you know, okay, well, you want to have move weapons, cannons, horses by boat and, and you know, canal boat, but mm -hmm. it's still incredibly complex. So mm -hmm. there are some anomalies, but I don't think it's as big of a conspiracy as people think. However, 
those Freemason architects using sacred geometry for all the designs may have been taking advantage of the natural earth energy of the ley lines in those spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's because the Nazis built all their radio towers and bunkers along ley lines. Hmm. That's the word. So that, I think, mm -hmm. is the funkiness about it. People are like, oh, they couldn't have built all this stuff. It's like, no, they could have. Well, the state took a lot of manpower. Remember, it may have taken a star fort was added on to over the decades until completion. It might have been added on for 100 years or 200 years mm -hmm. because they kept reusing the same forts and just expanding them. And we have documentation. The books say so. I've read I, all the books. I do believe there is something going on with them with the energy and the hydraulics that, you know, we're only just now learning um, that water has this, you know, um, magnetic or electrical value to it. Electromagnetic running water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, the Freemason engineers and architects, they have some cathedral esoteric knowledge. Mm -hmm. Cathedrals were analog waveform generators and gathering of acoustics and spirituality, you know, amplifying it. I've, so, I mean, there's a lot of esoteric knowledge that went into the building of military fortifications. I've you know, always felt that cathedrals were acoustic amplifiers. I've, I've oh, yeah, always oh, been yeah. convinced of that in my mind, been, you know, to enough cathedrals and churches and seen enough design and understanding that I, I definitely believe we've been bamboozled to what those buildings are for. You know, they've deified them. They call them temples. I'm going to go right off the ledge with this one. I think there's an ancient technology to cathedrals, the acoustics, the value of solidarity of the human voice. Yeah. That if properly trained, if the right person was at the podium leading the people in unison to the right sounds, that that sound amplifying and intention generator right. has massive human. benefit for us. Right, because if you heal the soul, the body will follow suit. Fair enough. Uh, we know that, and, and so uh, a lot of one person said that cathedrals were uh, about more about amplifying and generating love and light mm -hmm. and spirit mm -hmm. and otherwise than not so much religion. How about but this? Religion, definitely, the Vatican and everybody they took over and said, "Oh, oh no." Here's a hypothetical situation. Tony Rodriguez has said before that in antiquity, um, they had techniques for doing things. And now we've learned to bastardize these techniques and we come up with technologies. Okay. So now we're turning the corner of med beds coming out, which would be a technology, which yeah. we're told is a technology that has an understanding of the holographic nature of the universe and the harmonics and the balance of resonant frequencies and we can then take what we know is the appropriate harmony of the human body and we can take a body that's currently in a state of disharmony and we can saturate it with harmony per se to then bring the damaged body back into norm that's a way of describing what a med bed does Right. I would say that's a it, contemporary technology that I think the cathedrals of old may have been a technique for doing that. That now we have all of these people. We would fill the cathedral with healthy people. We would say we'd call out to the village. We have someone who's sick. They have such and such. Well, I am the stained glass windows. That's different frequencies of light. Yes, absolutely. And now you have the 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 I mean, organ. This this choir, massive. You know? massive instrument that you can't do anything but l literally feel everything about an organ going on in one of these facilities right remember captain nemo's organ on his submarine the victorians were obsessed with organ music interesting and they were expensive yet all the rich people had them in their homes uh there's something there the yes. cathedral is a healing center for people i mean who doesn't like choir music and all that I, I do i'm not religious i don't like religion but i like going to the national cathedral and the mm -hmm. choir music it is absolutely and people feel better when they leave mm -hmm. i mean my father's funeral was there in the national cathedral um i didn't like the religious part but the music was fantastic and so i knew that my wife and i were sitting there and yeah, City there's the there's something about that situation, the, the acoustics and everything. It is moving regardless. Right. And so a med bed may be just a concentrated mm -hmm. concept of that. Yeah, it's, it, 
it's a so technological way of bastardizing a technique of old. Right. We're going to get simple med beds at first. Mm -hmm. Very simple. And they won't give us the deep state ones that are healing the super soldiers. We'll get those maybe later on in a couple of decades, but they're letting out the technology with an eyedropper. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate because they can cure kids with cancer and everybody of everything. And it's, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's no money to be made if you do that. So they're going to mm -hmm. bring out a med bed and it'll help with ultrasound and, and some specific things, mm -hmm. but it won't be this universal healing device that mm -hmm. they have on the inside. Yep. There's a, there's yeah. a lot to be said for these technologies because there's, there's so much stuff that's suppressed that impacts our world on so many ways that we, we don't really think about. Like, so even, even in your amazing book, Lion, Tiger, Bear, there's a technology, right? That's yeah. amazing I, on so many levels for the airship, right? But just keeping things simple, keeping things simple. That airship is a technological wonder because of its ability to transport materials to the middle of freaking nowhere. That matters so much on our planet. I mean, I'm up here in Alaska, and there are – Lockheed Martin has big airships for transport that they're trying to put to market. New airships. Yes. That would be nothing like the airship in your book, John, technically, or exactly like it. But, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny. I don't know. But Lockheed Martin is working on these giant, what they're calling, airships for oh. massive transport into the middle of nowhere. Ken Buck says that there's some anti-gravitic or anti-gravity tech in those things. Sure, they've filled up with gas for all we know is hot air. <laughs> and they just got a, a plasma accelerator in their middle, and they're like, oh, heavy lift. And it's like, huh, that's weird. It can go 700 right. miles an hour. Right. Hmm. So like, like we see in so many other circumstances, we see information that gets um, put out right in front of people, and we know they're not going to ask questions. So if Lockheed Martin just makes a big, huge ship, alludes to it being an airship by calling it an airship, so everyone thinks that it's a blimp, no one asks Jack Squat about what's going on because they just sit there listening going to, oh, so it can deliver 300,000 pounds to the other side of the, um, you know, the such and such range. I'd like one, you know. Yeah, remember, remember uh, in the 1897 airship mystery, and the Sonora Air Club, mm -hmm. they said that they, the dirigibles did not have traditional gas, but plasma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what Lockheed Martin is putting up there. They have a small plasma accelerator, zero point, and they inflate those gas bags with the plasma. Mm -hmm. That would lift. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not what's going on in my book with the airship, but it's not too far off. Uh, it's a way to hide high technology in high, plain sight. Yeah, I was I was actually working with a company that's now defunct, unfortunately, but we were trying to get contracts with Lockheed Martin and this airship company. They were um, trying to come to market here in Alaska, and we were looking to get involved with the logistics in the middle of nowhere, and it just didn't happen yet. You know, things started changing over here, you know, with all the different yeah. economies and budgets and if, things, but it's... it's Lockheed Martin is building a freaking airship, they have it already. That's not filled with helium. I'm sorry. Oh, they may fill one cell with helium and say, oh, look, we're taking on helium. Mm -hmm. But I would bet the farm they're using high technology in that uh, thing. I'll have to look up the yeah. stuff that I had on that one because they kind of put it on the back burner. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rattling numbers off the top of my head just to, you know, to, to, to make them seem huge. But they were absurd numbers. They were yeah. absolutely absurd numbers. Just well, don't put quote a picture in your final cut of this video of that airship. I think people would. I'll be try to pull up. I'll try to find the link on that one and, and get it in there. But yeah, because Lockheed was, um, they were pushing hard for a while. There's a lot of stuff going on in the middle of nowhere up here in the Arctic. There's a lot of DOD contracts and a lot of facilities being made to try to match with the other Arctic facilities um, that are yeah, being built in other nations. They're leaking this hidden technology out by the dropper, mm -hmm. but they've got a cover it up in plain sight and mm -hmm. say, uh, well, the med bed will cure the gallbladder problem, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, well, how does it do that? Um, you know, magic. Yeah. I have an so, article I have right in front of me right now. It says, um, as the U.S. military looks for ways to secure its energy requirements in the near future, it has now taken a significant step in this direction by selecting a site for its first, first 
micronuclear reactor. The Department of the Air Force has selected the Isleson Air Force Base in Alaska to pilot this next generation energy capability, a press release said. With increasing really? reliance on electronics in warfare, with increasing reliance on electronics and warfare. This just came out. We, we have electronics and warfare now, John, in case you didn't get the memo. Uh, yeah. The U.S. military's power needs have ballooned over the years and are expected to surge further. However, with an aim to rein in carbon emissions, even in matters of national security, you know, because that's the big threat. The Department of Defense is now turning to nuke now turning to nuclear energy as a cleaner and reliable source. Last month we reported that the Department of Defense was moving ahead with plans of installing a portable nuclear reactor in Idaho. Yeah. The press release also goes on to state that the micro reactor pilot is being built in response to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 that requires potential locations to be identified to build and operate a micro reactor before 2027. The Air Force will work with the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to facilitate the micro reactor pilot and to ensure this pilot is conducted with safety as the number one priority. The press release said licensed by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This is where it gets great. This is the end of it, but this is where it gets great. The micro reactor will be owned and operated commercially. <coughs> Privately owned. <coughs> micro reactors are a promising technology for ensuring energy resilience and reliability and are particularly well suited for powering and heating remote domestic military bases like Isleson Air Force Base, said Mark Carell, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Environment, Safety, and Infrastructure. Isleson Air Force Base, located just 110 miles south of the Arctic Circle, relies on a coal-based power plant for its energy needs. As temperatures drop 50 degrees below zero, two locomotives at the Air Force Base move up to one thousand tons of coal every day to the power plant in the coldest months of the year an older press release states however it is not just heating problems that nuclear reactors are expected to resolve on earth portable nuclear power plants are also being looked up to push propulsion in space and power human settlements on faraway planets such as mars Really? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> they're yeah. just looking into this, John. You yeah, know, because just... you know the the uh, the military is now getting the idea that a small nuclear reactor might be good to look into. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they'll put them on a submarine someday. Right. It's like when I talked to the captain of the USS John Warner, and I put my hand on the hull, and I said, "This is powered by zero point, isn't it?" And he just smiled and laughed and nodded you know and mm -hmm. said oh you're interesting yeah it's yeah apparently it's 2021 and the united states military just learned that small nuclear reactors might be beneficial to the program <laughs> they've had zero point running since the 50s mm -hmm. it's a joke everyone knows it the program they're talking about right now is the um is the child of a program i've been following for years there was a company back in the day that was called hyperion power generation and they had gotten the green light from los alamos national labs so this one it said it was going to be owned and operated commercially that was the hint so this is the child of hyperion power generation because los alamos gave them the rights to put to commercial market what they called a, a nuclear battery it was about the size of a hot tub, had no moving parts, and could power pretty much anything you wanted for a really long time anywhere that you could drop one of these off at. Yeah, I wonder where they got that tech from. I wonder, you know, right? Yeah. You know, the thing is, Lockheed Martin is now in the energy business. Mm -hmm. And what's an aerospace company doing in the energy business? Mm -hmm. And they have wind and solar on their website. You know, bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a zero-point energy plasma accelerator torsion field thing mm -hmm. come on they can't keep that a secret forever and they know it they've got to try to normalize it and you know i believe the story is that ge is testing them in the back room but still charging people the same rates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so this is how they're going to slowly normalize mm -hmm. you know back engineered technology you know you know, not that, the, not that human engineers aren't clever. It said we really are. Mm -hmm. 
even, you know, if the stories are true and the super soldiers, you know, we build really good, tough stuff, mm -hmm. like a Ford, you know, electric Ford mining vehicles for, you know, off world mining mm -hmm. and, you know, basic spaceships. Absolutely. It's, 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 stuff. it's a testament to our engineering skills to be able to do so well when presented technology to even be able to back engineer it. Uh, it's my understanding that there's a lot of other species out there that don't function that way. You can stick it right in front of them and you have to tell them you got to hit this button to make it do this and, and they'll, they'll be operators. But they're not technicians, so to say. You know, they can't figure it out. They can't fix it. They'll use it till it breaks. But once it breaks, they just walk away. Yeah, or, and they never, they never engineer newer, better models. They stick Correct. with the old. Now, imagine giving a nuclear submarine to General Grant during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. You know, he would say, "Thank you." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but how do you run this thing? And you know, tell us how the science works. Mm -hmm. That would have taken decades. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we humans are very clever and we're very creative. And so they would have gotten, they would have figured it out by the 1880s or something. And maybe they did, you know, mm -hmm. Jules Verne, Captain Nemo. Part and of so, me is intrigued from, from your book and the concept of airships, just this idea that, you know, I believe that in antiquity, there's a lot of things that were around, you know, I believe electricity was rediscovered. I mean, in a, in a way, it, it always oh, yeah. existed. So Nikola Tesla just brought it into the fold for us, the people who didn't have it in our paradigm. But it's certainly, there's other people using electricity for eons. So now I, I wonder, you know, like, because your book, you know, there's obviously an idea of old concepts that are meandering and they're coming to people's minds in your book in like a first time situation. But it makes me think of these airships as, you know, people are seeing these for the first time it makes me think of in reality how long has this been going on on this planet i think forever you know how many different generations have we had you know the um the idea to me that you know yes we can we can um we can go into the ground and we can dig things up and we can say oh you know look we found a temple or look we found an old village but I do believe that there's also times that we must have gone through somewhere and found an ancient airship and that that well, technology would have been back engineered as well. That's kind of what I write about. I don't want Correct. to ruin the story. Right, and I don't want to ruin stories either, but these are, these are thoughts that I've had as well that to me were meandering thoughts, which is you know part of why I enjoyed the book so much, is that these things seem to me to be obvious, that they had to have occurred. And then we now look at the world around us and see that each of us is, is basically a, a, a solo pilot on a dinghy in a sea of misinformation. Yeah. You know, so how do we all, how do we all, you know, lash our, our dinghies together and start getting out of this sea of misinformation? I suggest to folks, they do things like read John's book so that you can open your mind up to other possibilities um, that the sea of misinformation isn't telling you. But that's the where my brain is at is that it's this antiquity thing and this I'm I'm really I guess having a hard time but also enjoying the idea that these technologies have been coming in and out of fad. I think I think what's happened is once Atlantis fell and there was the deluge and the Great Flood, a lot of that technology was lost, probably almost all of it. Mm -hmm. What happened was there was repositories of information and there were survivors that helped re-kick start uh, civilization. But people have been coming from space, all, you know, back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it stands to reason that if there was basic anti-gravity in the 1890s and they were able to go 200 miles an hour, that the Germans by 1942 could have cobbled together something like what I wrote about. Mm -hmm. Um, and they hadn't per per perfected the Nazi bell mm -hmm. engineering yet. But lo and behold, if they found something that would work, it's just like a hot rodder going to a junkyard. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, here's an old engine. I'm going to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. Well, in their case, it's, it's functional. But, it, you know, it's like, and they kind of hot rod this thing together. They just piece it together, you know, and, and they make it really big. And, it, you know, it has limitations can't fire recoil weapons it's not an offensive weapon mm -hmm. it's a, a cargo mm -hmm. but which it's kind still of has massive right. value when you it consider potentially than mm -hmm. they they know how to really you know it's it's way overpowered 
you know, it's like putting a, you know, a dragster supercharged engine in a Volkswagen bug. What hey, was, it works. But. Did you, I, I can't recall. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you must have because you're pretty detail oriented and I just can't recall the detail. Did you state in the book the, uh, the load capacity of the airship? Yes. Oh, yeah. The Germans being exacting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I give the load capacity uh -huh. and, you know, they have issues. That's why they bring in Gerlach and Porsche. They have mechanical issues. Mm -hmm. And and other things, uh, but yeah, I'm very detailed about it. Because, so they were you know, so so again, I'm just I'm I'm going to uh, the practical use of this. Like you said, it's just it's not even a, a, a weapon of war. But the value of this transport, I think people really need to consider how much something like that would change the face of the earth. Well, remember the stories of the Sonora Air Club and the 1897 airship mystery. Um, mm -hmm. Walter Bosley in his books describes that uh, they could not even fire. I wrote it in the in the in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, Bernie says they can't fire a Sharps Buffalo rifle from mm -hmm. it. It'll destabilize the electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. But you can drop something mm -hmm. that will not destabilize the field. Mm -hmm. So I'll let people's imaginations wander because the Germans aren't stupid. They're the opposite, and they're like they were way way ahead of their nuclear program that we're taught. Mm -hmm. And so by 1942. Or 43, I think they could have cobbled together a very crude atomic weapon mm -hmm. and drop it from extremely high altitude. Mm -hmm. And so that's where they were going. Mm -hmm. And that's why this mission that, that B and Bernie and everybody's on is so critical. It's like, because I think in, in real history, the Germans were close to dropping uh, an atomic bomb on London or Moscow. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have a plane quite big enough i mean they did by 43 the six engine uh ju uh, the Junkers thing and but um the 390 six engine transport they did but that's limited by altitude that's like a twenty five thousand. you know a russian fighter could have intercepted that slow thing mm -hmm. and drop it on german territory and have it explode so you have to start thinking gearhead wise what can you use to drop an atomic bomb from 60, 70,000 feet where no one can touch you mm -hmm. in World War II? Mm -hmm. And that's what the bear is all about. It's like, yeah, it's a dandy cargo hauler, but guess what? We could drop a lot of shit and they'll never even hear it coming. Mm -hmm. and, that's, you know, and that's, and that's still, and that's still um, framing it as um, a weapons platform. It yeah, massively but, valuable. Right. So it's, it is a weapons platform, but mm -hmm. only for one thing. Totally understood. But now just going aside from that, using it back to its logistics platform, just for hauling stuff. If we had fleets of these all over the world, providing logistical support to transport of materials and all these things, we it would change every commercial market. Yeah. It's going to because mm -hmm. there's profits to be made. Mm -hmm. So those airships and other transport technologies by air in the next 25 years, mm -hmm. they will change uh, the economy. But remember, there's billions and trillions to be made. Mm -hmm. So it fits in with the, you know, the deep state uh, banking paradigm. You know, mm -hmm. they don't want to change that too quick. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're looking at is probably when you and I are gone, a world where I hope not, but it's still fascist. It's still, you know, Maybe they don't have money, but maybe they have an electronic system or something. Mm -hmm. Because money is slavery. Mm -hmm. And you can't have an elite without the slaves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what they want. I'm hoping it's not going to go that way in 30 years. I think mm -hmm. it's going to... Too many people are going to catch on because of, you know, weirdos like us <laughs> telling strange stories. And it's like, whoops, all of a sudden it starts making really a lot of sense because wait a minute, we've got flying cars and anti-grav and self-driving cars and electric things and zero. They want electric cars. And the only way that's going to work worldwide is using zero point. Right. You can't have a billion cars around this planet going electric. Not if they still have to get charged off the same distribution system. That's what people don't get. If you're going to have the same production system and distribution system, the only thing they're adding to the system is more load. <laughs> Which takes right. more fossil fuels for the demand. They're just adding more demand and load to the system. Right. And what is Tesla making in, in uh, Nevada, that big facility? The word is their, their batteries made from denatured nuclear material. 
that store a charge infinitely more than any battery we have now. Mm -hmm. And there might be other technologies incorporated in that, but that makes sense because these new cars in 10 years, it's like I tell everyone, wait five, another five years, mm -hmm. and then we'll have charging stations in every gas station, mm -hmm. but it's the batteries, mm -hmm. the ones that won't catch fire, the ones that will give you a thousand mile range. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's like, oh, Tesla. And it's like, that's not a car company. It's a technology company. Um, I don't, you know, it's cool. They're fast. I think they're good looking cars. They're, they're pretty well built, but there's no infrastructure. You know, I looked at the charging stations where I lived out in Virginia. There's like two and they're, well, you know, 80 miles apart. That's not practical. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can plug it in at home, but, you know, when there's charging stations in every single gas station, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, a hundred of them, hundred charging stations, then this makes sense. I, I want an electric car. They're fast, but they're very, know. very heavy. Yeah, they are very heavy. Yep. And Ferdinand Porsche designed this 120 years ago. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, oh, it's new technology. That bullshit. You know, the battery technology is much better than they had 120 years ago. Yep. But the electric motors are basically the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not been a lot um, to to a, an electrical motor, which is basically Tesla's design as far as I'm concerned. And there's not too many people that have done anything to improve on anything that Tesla's designed to the best of my knowledge. I mean, seriously, just look at our power production and distribution system. Is it no, any different now good. than 100 years ago? We could have been out of it 120 years ago. By yeah. the time Ferdinand Porsche rolled out that car for Loner or Oster Daimler, I can't remember which one, but uh, he did it. And they did build some, but people had the same problems in 1903. There wasn't enough places to charge them. And plus the batteries only had like a 60 mile range. It's, it's literally like the same system, the, the substations, the transformers on the poles, yeah. the wires, the isolators. Not a goddamn thing has changed. You could take you could take a lineman that was working in Manhattan in the 1900s, and he'd have the same job today. Yeah, pretty much. It's the exact same system. There's no improvements. What a, where else can we look in our world and see something that was so not improved upon? Yeah, so it's well, either it's either a a testament to Tesla being awesome, which he was, or b a testimony to people that don't want any efficiency or advancement, which is also true. Yeah. I mean, oil, the oil, coal, gas economy was mm -hmm. kept in place because of the profits. Right. And my family, the Mellon family, made a lot of money off standard oil and Gulf. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why it hasn't been the impetus to change. Mm -hmm. I think they're changing it slowly now. In 20 years, we'll be off gasoline, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But they'll make it so that it works in that money economy mm -hmm. still. Absolutely. Yep, I've oh, been... look at all the great things you people have now. You have med beds and, and other things, but they'll still be a slave. They want them to be us to be slaves forever. Mm -hmm. And what is Tesla now? A trillionaire? Probably. Yeah, I think he the, the word is he's the fir world's first trillionaire. Now I don't think that's true. I think I was just listen. thinking that too. I'm like, hmm. Yeah, the Royals, they've yeah. had trillions of dollars for a long time. I've I've worked for some folks that I swear to God I think could could purchase billionaires in the blink of an eye. Yeah, there's unlimited money in the mm -hmm. world. It's just yeah. I've worked just, I've worked for people that definitively were laughing at people that thought Rupert Murdoch was rich. I mean, I think it's moot point now. Yep, yep, yep. The, truly, the three percent elite circles of of the world. Truly, the three percent of everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, money is meaningless. Absolutely. Yep. They they don't probably don't even use it. They they're flying around in black triangles as their private jets. Mm -hmm. uh, they have underground bases at their disposal. They have uh, they don't need cars. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know they're they're flying around in little things. You know the little things that are coming online like the quadcopters. Mm -hmm. Now those will be electric. It now, almost I'm seems sure to me in a way. That like the whole money scam in a way, like you were saying, like it's not like they need the money. No. But in a, in a way, it's like they need you to not have it. That's the power yeah. play. So they, they need to have an economy that has a lot of money available, and they just need you to not have it. They need you to want it, 
They need you to labor for the things that you know all the stuff. But it's you're right because they the 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 wealthy certainly don't need any more money. But what they do need to make sure of is that you don't start getting it. So it's like they need to go out and like whatever whatever money is occurring in the economy, whatever growth is occurring, they need to come in and there's a way that they need to take that away from you, and they will. And they do get it, but again, it's not that they needed it. They just needed to make sure you didn't get it. Because it's like, it's not like they need all the food in your fridge. They have food in their fridge. Yeah. But if you have food in your fridge, then they're not important anymore. So they need to keep cleaning your fridge out so that they can start, you know, being the boss. And you can be like, hey, boss, man, I need I need more food in my fridge. Can I get a raise? Oh, well, let's talk. Yeah, it's the Anunnaki caste system that's come down through history. Mm -hmm. You know, the India, they have an open caste system with, mm -hmm. I don't know, a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. In America, we have like five. You know, it's it's from the billionaires on down. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Elon Musk, a trillionaire on down. But they need that system to work for anyone who's under, you know, probably $100 million, they need it to work, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so that's going to take a while to dismantle. Mm -hmm. But they, it's money is becoming increasingly meaningless, in a sense. Um, Bitcoin is just AI. Fuck that. Um, all that electronic currency. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Chris Mellon, my cousin, his brother Matthew Mellon, who I knew better, he was he, supposedly he made a billion dollars on Bitcoin, but that was on paper. <laughs> So it might have been meaningless. Anything's possible. And even in, in Ponzi scams and, you know, all of these things, there's money to be made. There's not a lie that money can be made. It's yeah, just, you know. Little, that's why they're, they're getting away from a cash society. You know, you can't even use cash at certain markets and businesses now that's credit card only. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, at, at some point in the next 15, 20 years, cash will be gone. It'll, they'll make it illegal, worthless. They're definitely they're trying. I'm, I'm so against that. Close. I'm so against that direction. But you are right. That, that is the what? momentum that we're headed towards. Yeah, look at Weimar Germany. The marks you needed a billion marks to buy a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. Paper money, even gold, they'll devalue gold, mm -hmm. especially if they dig out those Swiss tunnels and all that. Gold will go to ten cents an ounce. All yep. All of these things are perspectives that can be manipulated, and that's the power play of time for the folks that are in the positions um, that don't currently have to worry about money. I mean, so many people can't even actually consider that. To me, that's like true wealth. Wealth is being able to wake up in the morning and not have to worry about money. You can just move forwards with whatever your creative mind wants to do, and you can put your energy towards things. A lot of folks would be shocked at how few and far between these people are that exist. The vast majority of people are caught up in the survival of life. And yeah. a lot of that being caught up is through the intentions of the people that aren't caught up, making sure the others stay caught up because that's yeah. to their benefit. Self-perpetuating system that is closed. Mm -hmm. closed system you know it's like steam generator you know mm -hmm. on a submarine closed system mm -hmm. and so you always got to have that impeller you know steam engine working mm -hmm. and uh, but it's breaking down i um, agree it's getting harder for them to, to 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 fleece the population of the monies so to say you know yeah. people want the fruits of their labor which is a very respectable position um, I think a lot of folks, you know, get invested in the stock market, average Joes, you know, they get invested in the stock market, think they're going to get rich like the big guys, but they don't understand that they're not a market manipulator. You know, in reality, the stock market left alone will always go up in time, but the power is being able to rip the rug right out from under it and profit when you know it's going down and the average Joes never know when that's coming because they're not manufacturing the problem. So that's when the rich folks just kind of come and fleece everybody pretty regularly. You know, we had the the Great Depression. We had one pretty recently, which I would say is history is going to show is worse. Um, but that's a, a game of the wealthy. You know, when the stock market crashes, all the vast majority of people lose their money and are under the impression like, oh, the money disappeared. We all lost our money. Yeah, nothing disappeared. Nothing disappeared. You all lost it to the same couple of dudes that manufactured the slide. Right. So and again, they didn't need the money, but they got it because they just needed everyone else not to have it. 
Right. So let's make a prediction for 25 years mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. And you and I will both, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you mine. Mm -hmm. So 25 years from now, I think it's very possible we'll be in a cashless society. It'll be a digital credit system. So you, you earn points and then you withdraw points. It'll just be all electronic nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, there won't probably, probably won't be a stock market per se. Um, we'll have new whiz bang technology, free energy, electric cars, mm -hmm. you know, some medical gadgets, although there's a lot of money still to be made off cancer, sadly. Mm -hmm. But it, they're, they're going for a world where they, they'll keep people fairly healthy, unlike now, which I think the system sucks. Uh, but you're even more of a slave because there's not even a hint of freedom. Mm -hmm. They say, somebody coined said that the phrase, you know, that, that Americans are free range slaves. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of freedoms, perceived freedoms. Yep. But in reality, unless you have enough money, you can't get on a plane. Right. You don't have a vax card, you can't get on a plane. You know, it, it just, there's a lot of limitations. Yeah, you can go state to state without papers, but you know, you still need passports and mm -hmm. vax cards and, and they're going to make it. So you need all these electronic IDs for everything. Yeah. When, when I visit New York, I find I, it's so sad to me to visit New York because it it's like being in an open air prison. That's what I feel yeah. like. The amount of security cameras and reconnaissance stuff and full blown DC. police presence yeah. that's everywhere. It's like it's like are, are we is. Is there an imminent attack coming? Like, what's going on? Why do we have all of this infrastructure for safety? Like, what's what's the threat? What's going on? Well, I'll just say that, you know, even the military, some of them have been quoted as saying ET is in charge at the very top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not the nice ETs are in charge. Mm -hmm. So they want to have everyone on camera. Everyone's tracked by their phone, even by their electromagnetic body signature. Mm -hmm. They can track you. So nowhere to run unless you go underground. Mm -hmm. And even there, I don't even know. And so they want to monitor everyone. They want to put a chip in everyone's brain or they're doing it now with nanites. That's frightening. Mm -hmm. With viruses and, and vaccines, they might be doing that right now. And so they want to create a, a self-perpetuating slave society where there's no chance of protest, no chance of people disrupting the system. It's smooth. It's like, it's like Nazi Germany on steroids with high-tech, really high-tech stuff. That's kind of what they want. That's what certain people have described that some off-world civilizations are like that. You know, it sounds from penny stories, the Germans who went off world, the no Schwabenlanders, mm -hmm. it sounds like their society is a slave based, high tech, uh, elite uh, caste system society that's based on Arianism and mm -hmm. Asatru and, and other things like that. I think they've already done that. Mm -hmm. And it works perfectly for them. Mm -hmm. But it's not great for the slaves and other people that are brought in. You know, I. I agree with that a hundred percent because that's what's going on down here is right. And it's not, I, I mean, I think the term slave is inflammatory, incendiary, whatever you want to call it. It pisses people off that they, they get resistant to the idea. So then they don't want to believe it. Right. That can't be because that would be, that would be bad. And I, you know, there's a lot of yeah. holy rollers out there. God would never allow that. And then that way they – so now they also don't believe in aliens because you just said something that couldn't be because God wouldn't allow that. So people are so resistant to all of these ideas, right? And what I would like to change your word there and what you had is just remove the words, this slave concept, and let's just look at, look at it like a farm. We're not being slaved. We're being farmed. As and well. we do that with everything here right now. We farm chickens. We farm cows. We farm corn. They're commodities. That's all it is. There's no personal feelings. We don't get mad at the, most of us. Don't get mad at the chicken. We don't get mad at the corn. You know, we don't give it any feelings. So I don't. I don't think that any of these off-worlders are necessarily evil slave traders. I think they're just farmers. A lot of them, yeah. And they're just. It's just. It's just business. And I'm just a galactic chicken to a lot of different things out there. Yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely something to that as well. It's it's sort of that indifference, right? Kind of like, hey, you guys are great, but 
Mm-hmm. You're really valuable to me as a commodity too. So, do you cry over the grilled asparagus as you bring it in to put it on the dinner table? No, I mean we slaughter animals right and left. So, you know, it's society is geared a certain yeah. way. But there's no doubt the Great Awakening is happening. Uh, people's consciousness has been expanding since at least 1964. Mm-hmm. You know, in the 60s. Um, and there's no, they know they're giving us this UAP dog and pony show. Mm-hmm. They're exposing certain things to try to keep the narrative going in their favor, mm-hmm. the deep state favor, because that represents the ET at the top. Mm-hmm. And they're doing their bidding. So in, in a sense, all those royals and committee of 300, we're all trustee slaves. So it's like, it's like the death camps. They had the Jewish guys, they had the armband, they were capos. Mm-hmm. They were fed better and given more blanket and clothes, but in the end, they were slaughtered too. Right. Mm-hmm. Hello, and and you know, but you talk to a billionaire who who understands what we're talking about, and they're like, "Yeah, but I still love my private jet and yacht." And it's like, "That's great, but I'll bet you still have COVID unless you have a magic pill they gave you." Mm-hmm. You know, I'm suffering. I'm coming off COVID. It's grim. <clears throat> um, I lost some weight. That's a good thing. <laughs> but you know, it, it's pros and it cons to everything. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, all this thing about how, unless you're in that 1% of the deep state or 2% that has access to this amazing medical technology, you're just a scumbag like the rest of us. You're going to get sick. Uh, you're going to grow old with aches and pains and I have a bad back. You know, it, you're not going to escape the issues. I mean, my grandfather was a billionaire. He had terrible health. Uh, he had he had spine problems like I do, and he had uh, he died of cancer at the end. And he, you know, he he for all his wealth, he did not benefit from any miracle medical technology. Mm-hmm. That I can tell you, I saw the guy suffer. So did my dad. So did everyone's dad and grandfather and grandmother. Mm-hmm. I, I think you know. I wonder. I bet it's a very small group that have access to the whiz bang. ET medical technology. Mm-hmm. It's the super soldier, you know, black ops stuff and, and USAPs and things like that. I think it's a very small number, but boys, because that big medical, big pharma, big medical mm-hmm. is a trillion dollar worldwide business. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to fuck with that. Yeah, that's They've true. They've got to figure out how to m- monetize the med bed. And that's why they'll give us version 1.0. And in the deep state, they're probably using version 100. And we'll get version 1.2, then 1.4. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll it'll be the eyedropper. Yeah, I, I'm I'm um, I'm intrigued. I recently recalled, and I don't know if you and I discussed this, but I had um I had sustained an injury to my right arm, um in the actual power plant, not the we had what we called the EPP, which was the emergency power plant at South Pole, our backup unit, but in the uh, actual power plant, um, I went to go move a a drum. I think it was a lubricant, and it was, um, I think it was a 75-gallon drum or an 85-gallon drum instead of a 55, and I wasn't paying it that much attention, so my ergos, everything was just wrong, and when I went to go, I went to go yank on that drum, and um, I tore my bicep, which, you know, people, it, it, now I'm even saying it, it sounds funny, like, oh, you went to use your arm, and you almost ripped your own arm off, and it's like, well, that's no, how... That's how taxing the environment is at South Pole, like that lack of oxygen and your your oxygen being off and your water levels being off for periods of time. Like injuries happen fast and furious. Um, <clears throat> so with that being said, I wound up like blowing out my arm really badly. And the, um, the surgeon at the South Pole, um, he was – he's CIA. I mean straight up. He – you know, I don't believe he was ever out. You know, people say, I'm not in the CIA anymore. Okay, 10-4, you were in it your entire life, and now you're not, though. Okay, 10-4. Um, but he was um, a, a surgeon and a pilot in Laos and Cambodia. He was, like, with those Mac V. Sog dudes over there running around wrecking havoc. And um, now he was our guy at the pole, and he, you know, diagnosed my arm, so on and so forth. And he told me that it was going to um, be screwed up for, like, the whole rest of the season like he told me like don't even have expectations which was the weirdest thing because in in my head the whole time i kept thinking no i'll show him i heal really fast and he's going to be surprised 
the long and short of it was it, it, it did wind up healing really fast regardless, whether it was my own intent um, or something that he did that he wasn't telling me. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, they said the best doctors in the, up here. That's an old saying, and it's mm-hmm. true. You know, that's why doctors use placebos mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in certain circumstances, and they worked fine. Mm-hmm. You know, my favorite was the old MASH episode from the 70s, and they ran out of morphine. And one guy said, let's scrape the powdered sugar off the donuts and put it in capsules. Mm -hmm. And if we really sell it, it will work. Now, that episode was based on a true story. I believe it. And I know the placebo effect to be – I I, I know this to be a fact. You don't even have to convince me. Yep, I've studied this. Doctors prescribe sugar pills to people all the time. Yep. Well, even even just – Oh, you got a little elf in your – Digging a hole in your back. Okay, here's the even pills. if people if people do research into the research and development of up and coming drugs, the vast majority of the people in the research programs are getting better, and we're never given the drug. That's what most studies show: is yeah. that a we don't need to give anyone any drugs. Because it turns out when we bring them in here and they're sick and we give them nothing, they get healthier anyway. That's what billions of dollars in research and development in the pharmaceutical industry is not telling anyone. You don't need a pill. You just need to believe you can heal yourself. They have studies upon studies upon studies that back that up forever. Yeah. No, I believe it. That's the part that they withhold. You know, the mind, the mind, I'm certainly, you and I are both people that have done things in our lives where most people just couldn't do it because we put our minds to it and we believed, I believe my father, he said, you're going to become a pro racing driver and go 200 miles an hour. That's going to take a certain mindset. Mm -hmm. You've got to believe you can do it. Mm -hmm. And um, lo and behold, it's a lot harder than people think. (laughs) I have around Daytona at night. It's, it is, it is absolutely something that is horrendous. Um, and it's like you've got to have that mindset where it's like, you know, I am trained. I've trained myself to do this, and I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And high heat, you know, I've been through 160-degree, you know, cabin in, in the car, you know, just barely making a 90-minute race. You know, it's it's beyond superhuman. Now, I was younger in my 30s, but mm-hmm. still, it's, you know, you can push yourself to limits if you can train yourself to do it. And it's a lot of that is up here. Absolutely. Because a lot of people are like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And it's like, well, you're never going to do it if you have that mindset. Absolutely. There's been so many times I've said to people in, in, in different capacities, job sites, when a task needs to yeah. get done and it doesn't get done. Okay. There's two reasons that task didn't get done. Either the person that you put on the task didn't have the ability or didn't have the desire. Yeah. You have to have a burning desire. To right. Which you- and I all day long, I would rather work with people that have the burning desire and no ability than the reverse. Because if somebody has all of the ability in the world and no desire, it's still probably not going to get done well or right or at all. Yeah. But somebody who have- doesn't even have the skill set, if they have all the desire in the world, the task usually winds up getting done well still. Yeah, it's probably a, a combination is the best thing, but for I sure. Agree with you. You know, it's like um, there are people who think they can do things and then they go and try them and it's just hopeless. And it's like, well, you didn't do the hard work. Mm-hmm. You just jumped into the harder portion of it. Mm-hmm. Which is stupid. You know, and you think you can you do this superhuman thing. And it's like the, the ego, they want to do something. Mm-hmm. Whether, it doesn't matter what the activity is, military, racing, uh, being in the, in the dense cold or whatever. They want to do something, but they don't have the mindset and they're not willing to take the small steps right. needed to get there. Yep. They just want to jump right in like an arrogant ass. Mm-hmm. I've seen it. I've seen people be killed. You know, this one really wealthy guy joined my team and he bought a fancy car and he did, hardly had any experience. He just said, well, I'm going to buy my way in. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's not a good idea. You should do the something else for a while and gain experience. No, no, no. It's not that hard. And he ended up crashing and nearly killing himself. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's because a lot of people, people don't understand that dynamic of those four patches known as tires touching the road and moving weight around those four uber important parts of the car. Yeah. 
<laughs> or it's the military putting in um, a young soldier who's been trained, who thinks he can do the job, but turns out he has PTSD right away. And, mm -hmm. and, so, you know, and it's like, well, no kidding, because not everyone, even just because they won't have the desire to do something like that, doesn't mean they're suited for it. Right. And that's what they called shell shock and battle fatigue and all that crap. And that's, you know, B in my book, mm -hmm. she and Bernie both suffer from PTSD mm -hmm. because of her experiences and his experiences. And in those days that, you know, Alice teases her and says, you do not have, you have good old fashioned shell shock. And they argue and joke about it, but it, it you know, she really does have that, mm -hmm. but she has the mindset to overcome it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The will and the skill and the, and the intellect to overcome it and the bravery. Yep. There's, and, there's a, a lot of bravery in the book, actually, and overcoming. And I, um, I guess, how do I put it? I guess collaboration between factions that people wouldn't expect. And I thought that was a very interesting aspect of the book, is that above and beyond the standard war that was going on, that everybody, you know, there was, you know, definitely – a, a wonderful representation of different factions and how they engage in that environment. And, and you can see that um, your characters have, have years of exposure to each other and have worn different hats at different times. And I thought that was a great part of the book um, because it was so insightful to reality that things change, you know, and teams change in the blink of an eye. Oh boy, do they. they that's why Bernie makes them study hermetic wisdom. And I... I don't want to give out everything on the book at all, but yeah, chapter three was a very critical chapter. And I think one of the most important things about it was that it showed that we could all come from different factions for a yeah. greater good still. Right. And well, now what Bernie. are your thoughts about that? Right. So your book has aspects of reality and aspects of fiction. I would like to believe that that aspect of your book is functional in reality also i think so i mean you know there, there's a lot of stories in war about people coming together the enemy and you're in a situation you know it's like um in world war one on the russian front in the middle of the winter the germans and russians were fighting each other in trench warfare mm -hmm. now in the ukraine somewhere in the woods they were fighting well all of a sudden the wolves who were depleted of a lot of their game because a war is going on and all the rabbits are gone. And people are shooting the rabbits. The Russians shot a lot of rabbits. They started eating the soldiers brazenly in packs of a hundred. And so a German comes, goes to the Russian lines with a white flag and says, listen, we've got to do something about these fucking wolves. And they agreed on an armistice, arm, you know, for a couple of days and they went and they killed all the wolves. There's like a there's a third party combatant showing up. Right. And they saluted one another and they went back to their lines and then the fighting resumed. That's a true story. Wowzers. And you know, there are stories, you know, it's our duality, mm -hmm. you know. And in World War One again, you know, when there was an, a, a lull in the fighting, uh, a ceasefire, mm -hmm. the English and the Germans got out of the trenches and started drinking beer and, and playing you know, soccer, football. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, get back in the trenches. You know, the war's on again. And they're like, oh, shit. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Fritz. You know, mm -hmm. we'll see you after the war. Take your ball and, back. You guys forgot your ball. <laughs> yeah. And they would have <laughs> soccer games. And so it's this duality that mm -hmm. we're dealing with. And I show that in the book. You know, it's like these guys are on a very unusual adventure that's life and death. And everyone's got to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And even the, the Nazi SS guy, who's kind of a hard ass, mm -hmm. he softens. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some metaphysical things going on with the ship and vibration. And and I describe that. And most of the readers were like, I don't get it. But the people who understand that, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so they go through this transformation. Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. You know, and they come out friends, basically, except for Walter Gerlach. He remains an asshole Nazi. <laughs> To the end. And that's also realistic. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to play ball. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, there's some love triangles going on. You know, things like that. It, it, it's, it makes sense because in dire situations, men and women, nature being what it is, you know, they hook up. And sometimes they fall in love in wartime. 
extremely fast. Understood. Because everything is is on steroids. Everything is running at 100. You're living life at 100%. Mm -hmm. Whereas most people are live, going through life at 25%. It's I can totally fact. follow that. What you I were... never have. I just, I'm, I've always been intense. And my father said, you know, you could do anything you put your mind to. And he was right. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I, you know, we can't go to the moon. I don't think I want to. You know, we can't go underground if we wanted to. You know, we have a lot of limitations. But other than that, you know, I mean, I'm, age has given me a lot of limitations. I mm -hmm. you know, can't do this and that anymore. But it's okay. It gives me, I've calmed down and it's given me more intros, introspective. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the same way too. And I jokingly say now, I yeah. can do anything today. I can't, I can't do it tomorrow though, too. I'll be yeah. out for tomorrow. I can do it today though. Still, I can do anything today, but I'll be, I'll be, I'll be feeling it tomorrow. You know, I told my wife yesterday, we were walking near the Lincoln Memorial. It was mm -hmm. a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. And this guy on a 60 mile an hour electric skateboard weaved in between of a groups of us, mm -hmm. you know, like a jerk. And I turned to this guy who was vaguely my age. He was in his sixties, you know, with a beard. And I say, boy, time sure have changed. And he's like, yeah, there was never any of that in the old days. And it, it was such a comfort. We're strangers, mm -hmm. but it's a comforting thing because of our age, because we've been there and done that. Mm -hmm. And it's like these damn kids, just like my father said when I was a teenager or whatever, mm -hmm. oh, damn kids. Mm -hmm. You and your skateboards and electric, you know, this, that, and mini bikes mm -hmm. back then. And, you know, it's, but it, it's, there is, there is a comforting wisdom with age. It's like my old car group, we, we get together and I'm the youngest guy there at 60. Mm -hmm. It goes from 60 to about 90. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Cause they well, stopped making cars. Interesting. There's hundreds of years of knowledge mm -hmm. there. You know, mm -hmm. What do I do for my brakes on my 53 Hudson? Oh, here's a million things you can do. You know, it's, it's like that in aerospace or anything. It's like the older generation. But you start to lose some of your, you know, my father in the last 10 years, he just started to lose a lot of his intellect. Mm -hmm. And it's just natural. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's been programmed into us, I think. Yep. I but, agree. Um, I feel like there's probably, something to be said that with the, as we get older, that our, um, our memory banks, they're, they're just full. And yeah, you, you can't, you can't really gain more info unless you dump something out the back end. You got to lose yeah. something. <laughs> I don't think that's the case because the mind is non-local. So it's well, infinite. fair enough. Um, well, it's it's it's. I, I don't want to say so much the the case as it has to be that way. As just that's what I'm witnessing observationally. It seems to be what we're our, witnessing. Our pineal glands, which is our third eye, I think they degrade with age, like everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through yeah, through attack. Certainly, they're out there meditating every day. They probably don't lose anything, but mm -hmm. you know, for regular guys, you know. It, I don't meditate that often, but. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the, uh, the body temple as well is also under attack with all the shenanigans that we put into it probably yeah. doesn't help us at all. The food is terrible. I mean, they're obviously mucking around with our food genetics. Yep. And, totally. Uh, I have, you know, lower GI issues that I take prescription medication for. I won't bore anyone with that, but I'm sure that's something that's aggravated by all this processed foods and you know, i would imagine so i try to eat organic when i can but it's absolutely impractical it's totally stupid. understood Des and and which is it. which is designed to be that way yeah i don't trust the organic growers and you know, all these vegan people mm -hmm. i only eat organic it's like you're healthier than thou greener than thou better than thou mm -hmm. oh come on my mother eats nothing but organic since the 70s mm -hmm. and she just you know one sickness after another. I find a lot of people to be full of baloney when they say that stuff anyway. Like, oh, I eat healthy. I do this. I Really? You want to go walk up a hill with me right now and I'll watch you suck wind? What are you talking about, healthy? It, it doesn't make any sense. And, and I don't make sense either because I, my, my wife makes me green juice every day with, and fruit. Mm -hmm. and, and so we eat our good antioxidants and mm -hmm. greens and stuff. But I eat pop tarts and eat cheeseburgers. So there I mean, you go. that stuff poison. You but you know it at least. Yeah. I mean, you know, rather, you know, pop tarts are not food. The worst. <laughs> yeah, they're not food. But they're non dairy, and so I, I, have a I got you. <laughs> so I went to the doctor and I had a full physical, mm -hmm. and he said you're disgustingly healthy despite your back pain and 
your aches and pains. Your 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 liver's fine. Your you know, everything's mm-hmm. fine. Your heartbeat is fine. Your cholesterol is low. Mm-hmm. Your heartbeat is low. I mean, you know, I should be a train wreck. You know, and it's mm-hmm. and it's like no, you're disgustingly healthy. You may you have a lot of pain in your life. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of chronic pain. In mm-hmm. fact, those are those are mechanical issues. Yeah, your DNA, it, your chemistry like, is good. Really? Are you sure? I said, are you sure? Because I'm eating pop tarts and cheeseburgers with bacon. And he's like, mm-hmm. it's like my grandmother lived to be 99. She ate eggs and bacon and drank scotch every single day of her freaking life. Yes. I mean, there's a certain amount of stuff that's just perfectly good for you. And people will just refuse to believe that. Yeah. Eggs are great for you. Bacon's great for you. Vegetables and salad and fruit as well. Sure. But the U.S. Army nutritionist in World War One. That's how my grandparents met. Mm-hmm. My grandfather was a doctor in the Army. She was a Red Cross nurse and a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, she's like, you can have your Pop-Tart, but you're going to eat your applesauce and your ba- bacon and eggs. The way I look at it is if they grew it on a farm and baked it and cooked it in that kitchen on the farm, and it used to be on the farm kitchen family dinner table, you're golden. You know, you throw some bacon on there, some eggs, meatloaf. I mean, there's just like, you know, just regular foods, veggies, you know, corn, mashed potatoes and gravy. I'm fine. Farm to table is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But I worry about all the, even the organic, Mm -hmm. and they use organic pesticides. Mm -hmm. Because I think our soil is full of funky. Yeah, they change the terms and all types of stuff. I I don't know if you're familiar with the history of Nikola Tesla and fertilizer. Yeah, this is actually a, a big thing in our past. Is that this is actually, you know, everybody talks about you know Agenda Twenty One and they're trying to take over the food supply now, now, now. You think rich people just began becoming sinister and understood how to attack the masses? No, They've they been attacking the food supply forever. You can you can get old newspaper clippings from the late eighteen hundreds and the early nineteen hundreds that are showing Tesla technology which was a Tesla coil mounted in a way to like a combo tiller. So prior to there being a fertilizer industry where farmers needed anything off of their property because they didn't used to need anything off of their property. Farmers were completely self-sufficient and needed no industry to grow anything. They had it covered until the fertilizer industry showed up and convinced them that the soil wasn't right and blah, blah, blah. And they showed up after Tesla's technology was being sold. It existed and was being sold. A device that they could connect to their tractor and with the power takeoff, they could drag this device behind their own tractor, which would break up the ground. And then through the application of high voltage electricity, a Tesla coil, it would cause a plasmatic effect in the atmosphere they're electrifying the air in close proximity to the soil that was being broken up and they were precipitating nitrates out of the atmosphere so the farmers can fertilize their own crops right it's exactly right and and they were they knew tesla was a threat to the entire establishment Mm -hmm. but you know the irish round towers they have them in tibet too Mm -hmm. they're eight-sided towers these are made of stone Now, there's a thing in farming called power towers. And what they're doing is they're enhancing the natural electromagnetic telluric energy Mm -hmm. and using it for farming. They've been doing it for forever. Define using it for farming. Well, the, the, you know, you put this power tower in different places along your fields and stuff, and it naturally does the same thing that Tesla was doing. Okay. Gotcha. Probably a lower. Okay. At at, at a lower rate over a longer period of time. Yeah. Everyone's like, what's this round tower doing here? Okay. Well, it's hollow. What do you think it's doing there? It's stone is is storing that energy and and amplifying it. And um, in the grand scheme of things, a lot of people don't realize just um, by manufacturing a tower or a chimney, um, you get what's called a stack effect atmospherically. So by having an opening on the bottom and an opening on the top, um, even though you don't see it, there is flow. Yeah, that's exactly what these towers have. You can look it up online. They sell them in Texas, I think. Mm-hmm. They're called power towers. Mm-hmm. But very, I, you know, it's the huge production of food 
that's what they wanted to increase. It, it, worse food, but there's more of it. A lot of people don't realize that in the engineering of a chimney, there is induced draft. And it's um, off the, the design principles of the diameter of the chimney, the height of the chimney, the opening at the bottom, and the opening at the top. So um, there's a difference in atmospheric pressure from the ground level to the top of a chimney. So because the pressure is higher at the bottom than at the top, that's where the draft induction starts just in the original construction. So that's, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people build chimneys and they think like, oh, well, building a chimney to get the smoke out of the house, like as if it's just an exit. It's not just an exit. It's actually an induction device for draft. Yeah. That's why a fireplace isn't all that efficient at heating a home. Correct. Yes. Because it's constantly exhausting. It's letting everything up and out. That's why they have the, uh, the draft damper. Yeah. I mean, you know, this technology has been around They just people are rediscovering it. But back to your point, it's. Everything we have today is just a rediscovery. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. A million years ago on this planet, there was probably a hundred different star nations doing different experiments, different technology and, and all that. And that was all incorporated in Lemuria and Atlantis and the mm -hmm. other pre-Diluvian civil, high civilizations. You know, it's just we're re rediscovering it all. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the, the Freemasons building star forts and cathedrals, they were privy to some of that Egyptian mystery school energy sound wave mm -hmm. technology and they implemented it for defensive purposes perhaps uh there's certainly star forts are amazingly beautiful and, and full of sacred geometry oh i'm so intrigued by them as structures and the and the labor that went into them i mean i uh, you know I, right, but they, did, they did deflect <laughs> cannonball it's just, it's just like a tank's armor sloping armor on mm -hmm. a tank mm -hmm. it deflects a shell that's you know true but i right. mean um correlation it. isn't causation yeah but is mortar where my fire, brain goes mortar fire you know the english mm -hmm. dumped rockets and mortar fire on mm -hmm. fort mchenry mercilessly mm -hmm. for a long time before and we never surrendered because mm -hmm. we had earthen bunkers to go in and hide mm -hmm. but still mortars and rockets are an effective weapon to mm -hmm. any fort mm -hmm. unless you armor the top Mm -hmm. which later forts like the Maginot line, those were all concrete. The Germans didn't have anything to penetrate it. So they cobbled up the Gustav gun. But what else do they use the Gustav gun for? Well, mm -hmm. in Sebastopol, they lobbed a shell that blew up supposedly an underground ammunition bunker. But was that a crude atomic shell? I'm very intrigued by Maybe. this aspect of history. This is Maybe. extremely interesting to me because it's... It, this is a new concept to me presented from your direction. I've never had my brain go this way before, but it's extremely intriguing to me. And it is very reasonable for my brain to believe that that's exactly how it went down as you present it. I, 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 that makes sense to me, actually, that the Russians would want to hide it, that the Germans weren't promoting it. And there was just, because I have often wondered how the Russians could have been killed in such quantity. It's it's actually Joseph P. Farrell's uh, theory. Okay, fair enough. It, it's to me too, because I was always wondering. They say twenty seven million, but really, a lot of the two Russians I talked to over the email, they told me it was closer to thirty three million. I, I've always heard it presented like that the the, the Germans disease, were saying disease and 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 starvation too. But come on, thirty three million? How the hell do you kill that many? I've heard um, testimonies from Germans where they were stating that they were advancing as fast as they could in Russia. Yeah. They said the problem wasn't that they couldn't kill the Russians. They said they just couldn't kill them fast enough. They said the amount of Russians coming to the front line to get killed was right. beyond belief. But now to me, that logic doesn't make sense because that sounds to me like there's a whole bunch of people with desire to win, which is the Russians. Apparently there was no cowardice in Russia and they were all going right to the front lines. They, it they were seems, very proud to fight for the motherland. It seems to me that way, right? So it seems to me that way. So it sounds to me that there was a massive resource of determined Russians, which I know that are not cowardly, very tough people, to then show up to a line of people that are far from home, far from their logistics, nowhere near as determined, and not in the same massive amount of people. So to me, the equation seems like the 
massive amount of Russian people should have just been overpowering the Germans in the blink of an eye. And since history shows us that absolutely didn't occur, we just have piles of dead Russians. I really feel like uh, Joseph P. Farrell's explanation is the only one that actually is reasonable. Well, there's a lot. There's some more factors. Okay. In this because the Russian front mystery is complex. Okay. There's a story that, and there is some evidence to, to this, that Stalin was going to invade Europe on June 22nd. And the Germans invaded on the 21st, which was the solstice. And that the Russians were on a, an offensive footing, which is not good for defense. And so they rolled in there. The other thing is the Germans did not prepare for winter campaign. They did not have correct food. Mm -hmm. Lubrication oils were too thick. The Russians thinned all their oils, mm -hmm. guns, tanks, everything with gasoline. Mm -hmm. they did, the Germans did not have padded parkas like the Russians had. The Russians were 20 degrees warmer on average, I think, per soldier than the Germans because they only had wool and mm -hmm. a steel helmet, which conducts the cold. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they survived at all. The, the, the German food had a lot of horse meat in it, which was very lean. They didn't have enough fat. At, at, at Stalingrad, uh, they flew in a doctor. He said, my God, everyone's starving to death. And so they flew in this canned meat with a lot of fat in it. And then the soldiers started to die because it's refeeding syndrome. Mm -hmm. So here are the Germans making a shit ton of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And yet they go up against this millions of Russians and mow them down. Right. They had those barrage rocket canisters, the Nebel Weffer. Mm -hmm. I'm not pronouncing that right. Nebel, Nebel Weffer. Now, J.P. Farrell thinks they could have used fuel oil and coal dust to make a crude thermobaric weapon, mm -hmm. which is like a small tactical nuke. Mm -hmm. That's probably where most of the casualties came from is those weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, they might have had some crude, dirty bombs that they detonated by radio signal. Mm -hmm. You know, you just drive a tank or a truck mm -hmm. and then you blow it up. Um, but I think they used everything under the sun because the German high command thought, well, we'll be in Moscow by July or August. So we don't need winter clothing or, you know, special oil or anything. For the purposes of visual presentation, part of me wishes that somebody had made a movie that shows that battlefield like that. Yeah, good luck. You know, never, you know, what what never, would the battlefield never, look like when there's just lighting off thermo barracks in every direction and just wiping lay waste? I mean, that's these these are some serious munitions that we're talking about. Right. There's a there's a story that purports that up near in Latvia in 44 mm -hmm. or 43, 44, that the Germans lobbed an atomic weapon full scale, high, you know, uranium weapon. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the yield is, maybe three kilotons on um, this particular, you know, Red Army battalion and wiped it out in one fell swoop. Yeah, like that's where my brain is wondering, like what really happened in, in, in Russia in these yeah, types of battles and this savagery? And uh, lo and behold, you know, there's also there is a communique from Stalin through the Swedish embassy that Farrell states. And it got to Berlin and says, if you use those weapons again, we will unleash our entire chemical and biological arsenal on the Germany in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. Now, Hitler was a maniac, a psychopath that gassed his own people, but he had been blinded by gas twice. Some say it was hysterical blindness, but whatever, he was in the trenches. He won the Iron Cross. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a coward. And he wasn't an idiot. So... He might have said, well, I don't want my Aryan people and children being gassed and given the flu and worse. Mm -hmm. And he may have relented on that. But no one's quite sure. But we are sure that Putin said 27 million was the, was mm -hmm. the number. That's still a shit ton to kill with artillery and yep. <clears throat> bullets and bombs. It's, it boggles the mind because the Allies didn't collectively didn't lose a million. Mm -hmm. They, they've lost 990,000. So how do you kill that many people on the Russian front? Yep. And everyone's like, oh, they, they starved them and there was disease. And it's like, yes. My, my, I really want to know. I want to know what was like the single most deadly mus munition ever applied. Like what one shot took out the most people ever. You know, there's the one day, there was one battle. 
Yeah, the thermobaric rocket barrage, because you could have thousands of them. And there's film footage of them being launched by both sides. Okay. But if the Germans had cobbled together, they had plenty of coal. Coal dust and fuel oil mm-hmm. ignited will make a decent thermobaric, you know, it's an air burst. Yes, it's, I'm, I'm, I can totally, this is like, you're talking, this is like a savage form of napalm, actually. Absolutely. What worked in Vietnam? Mm-hmm. Napalm. Nothing else. Our bombing didn't do shit for the Homie Chumi Trail. Agent Orange did, it did some, but mostly it was the fucking napalm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And they hated that. They hated the napalm. But the, you know, the North Vietnamese were smart. They dug tunnels. Mm-hmm. So to get rid of it, but the napalm did the trick. So the same thing on the Russian front, they, ha- they needed weapons of mass destruction that were cheap and plentiful. And you could get that done with the fuel air bomb. And I think they used them up until the end of the war. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Russia ended up, you know, production of tanks and, and men and weapons. They just outproduced the Germans. The Germans made so many mistakes for a very clever military. Mm-hmm. You know, the horses pulled their guns and carts from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. And the men ate the horses on the Russian front when they froze. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, like I said, they had problems. Horses aren't very fat. So you, you have problems. You can starve to death just eating horse meat. Mm-hmm. People don't understand that. Part of me US wonders are. now in, in the big picture that maybe, you know, with the idea that the Germans in some capacity were dealing with some other faction, who, whomever from wherever, that was giving oh, yeah. them advanced intel and technology, right? Because that, I believe, did happen. I wonder if just in that... um false sense of security that Hitler might have thought, you know, we we have the advantage, we have the technology where gun to win, right? That that's where his mindset was at, um, which I would say would be like similar to like when Admonson and Scott were racing to the pole. Scott was trying to go with all of the advances of technology to win. And yeah. Admonson was going in the other direction. He wanted no technology. He wanted basic. He wanted traditional methods that were proven that don't break down and i almost feel like that might have been what happened with the germans as you know as presented at face value that you know that they you know they lost the war so to say um because sort of. you know that that their their conventional warfare machine lost the war yeah the german state surrendered but none of the nazi party or any of the nazis surrendered understood because they took all the technology to America and Argentina and probably Antarctica. Hold on one second, John. Hold on a second. Okay, we're back. Had a little uh, little disturbance at the front door. Just have a guy come to give an estimate on some work on the pad here. So uh, sorry about that, folks, and sorry about that, John. Disturbance in the force. Yes, a disturbance in the force at the front door. <laughs> but um. I really, really thank you for all the time that you you gave me here, John, both before and and during the interview. And I really want everybody to to get this book, Lion, Tiger, Bear. It is a fantastic read. I was uh, riveted. Um, I, I'm I'm slightly mad at you new for getting me back into reading now because now I'm just wondering when you're going to write the next book. Well, I'll start it soon, but um, you know I do touch upon where the German technology was coming from, that it was a combination of things, of archeology span and clever engineering and also some ET help and where that was coming from Mm -hmm. and how it worked. And I think it's probably, you know, in my mind, it's probably somewhat close to what really happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but everyone was getting assistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's clear to me that the Americans and the English, we weren't getting as much as the Germans, uh, but we were getting some mm-hmm. from somewhere. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm going to dig that out. In the and there's definitely week. a lot more in your story for more story. I can tell yeah. everybody that much. You could, you could keep going with this. I was intrigued. I had, um, I guess I would say a, a, a surname cameo appearance in the book, which I thought was really fun and interesting, but even, yeah. even more so Lieutenant Hecker. Lieutenant Hecker, right. Which I thought was actually, oh God, if you see anyone leaving this room, you plug them, which I thought was great. But also I thought it was great because in your story, right. There's a lot to be said for who's read into what situation. Yeah. I, and I, apparently I 
Apparently, Lucy. Lieutenant Hecker knows a lot in your world because he was allowed in the room that was the super secret conversation. And I thought well, that was interesting. He was allowed outside. Okay. Well, he was, he was, it sounded, it sounded like he was in the room the way you wrote it. It sounded no, like he, he was let in. He shut the door and he was outside with the. Oh, okay. 10 4. 10 4. So, no, he wasn't read in per se. Oh, okay. Then I read it wrong. Very high ONI security clerks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but Bernie and um, Simpson, they go at it. And mm -hmm. I think there were people like Bernie, you know, they were like you and me that knew the occult and who were, had studied all their lives, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Navy needed those people in World War II. I, like I agree they that there's. Crowley. They needed Crowley. And Bernie is kind of Crowley's crude approximation mm -hmm. in america except without the dark mm -hmm. crowley was dark he yep kind of evil my ability yeah. to troubleshoot boilers depends on my experience in troubleshooting all kinds of other boilers so folks like bernie the secret agent folks that find themselves in peculiar rooms at times need to be experienced in the activities of peculiar rooms and not everybody has the resources to be that referenced. So there are certain factions that have to look for these types of folks because those are the decision makers that you need to have. You know, I can only troubleshoot boilers because of my experience. So in order to be a good boiler repairman, somebody's got to tap me for that job. Just like in other rooms and other troubles presenting themselves, they need to tap people that have experiences in these things. It's just that simple. Yeah, which is exactly the ethos of the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, which mm -hmm. my grandfather was in in World War II. The OSS mm -hmm. was read into the UFO file from Donovan mm -hmm. and, you know, the IPU stuff with the uh, interplanetary unit with FDR. Uh, they needed the best minds that are had been world traveled. That's why they had scientists. And I don't know why they picked Mo Berg, the Red Sox catcher, but they did. I know about his history, yeah. actually. Yeah, they needed James Bond types on the front lines, but they he also was, needed scientists. He was apparently one of the smartest men on the planet, is what everyone oh, on his sure. team said. I'm sure. They said it's he... So, it's oh. like Hedy Lamarr. Mm -hmm. Why she wasn't tapped for the OSS, I don't know. She was a movie star. Mm -hmm. Let me and jump she, out of here, John. I'm sorry, I got... I mentioned her. She's awesome, but I, I got this guy here right now. I apologize. So let me uh, right. let me wrap everything up. Everybody, thank you for coming so much. I really appreciate it. And... um. Have an excellent day. See you later.